this is the uh, flip for alternative energy. So we left off last time talking about sustainability and that sweet spot on people, planet, profit. And we also looked at how much U.S. energy um, is used per the different um, kinds of energy. But it's also helpful to think about it by industry um, because when we start to think about that carbon capture piece when we talked about solutions and mitigation, uh, we also need to know about where that carbon dioxide is coming from. So another thing to think about are point sources versus multi-source. Um, and so when we think about these different places um, that carbon dioxide can come from and, and where we use energy, um, if we look at the transportation industry, that's what we would call a multi-source. If you think about all the different cars out there, all the planes, all the trains, all the boats, all the trucks uh, that carry our goods and services and people around and whatnot, there's a lot in that transportation industry, a lot of places for carbon to enter the atmosphere. That's considered a multi-source. Um, but if we start to think about these ones when we're talking about electrical generation, these ones are usually point sources. They come from one power plant, whether it's coal or electric or, excuse me, um, coal or nuclear or whatever, um, these would be point source. So when we're thinking about point source versus multi-source, multi-source is usually we try to move everything to a point source so that we can then use that carbon capture and um, uh, and sequestration. Um, and that's going to be really important as we start to talk about these um, alternative energies when we're starting to think about solutions and why we need to move there. Um, as we talk about alternative energies, one of the things we need to, some of the things we need to think about are cleanliness, like it, does it produce carbon dioxide? Is it renewable? Can we get more of it? Is it efficient? Does it use that energy uh, well? And will it fit current infrastructure? Because that's going to speak to that cost. So the first one is solar energy. Um, solar comes in two forms, passive, where you just kind of heat something up, um, so in other words, standing in the sun to get warm, but then active solar collectors that either um, that generate electricity in some way, shape, or form. Um, so this picture on the left is a solar array, and what we see, this one works on old infrastructure. These are all a bunch of mirrors, and then you can see this kind of point in the middle. Um, there's a water tower there, and that all the sunlight focused on that one point heats the water up so it forms steam and that steam is then used to turn a turbine. Anytime we turn a turbine, that's old infrastructure. So that one is old infrastructure. This you can see is a picture of Creighton's parking lot, and these are their solar array there. So Creighton's trying to go off the grid, um, and so we see that those LED um, panels, are, or photovoltaic panels, excuse me, those ones are um, new infrastructure. Um, solar power is clean, um, it's non-polluting, um, no carbon dioxide, um, and it's um, efficiency, I kind of put that in between a benefit and a drawback. Um, yes, it's efficient, but here's the deal. Um, people who argue against efficiency for solar are like, well, you can't get all the sun that comes in because a lot of it bounces and uh, you can't get all the sun energy that the sun produces because it's so big. Um, that's all true, but that actually counts against solar's efficiency. Um, and because um, like photovoltaic cells require uh, new equipment, that's new infrastructure, that's what's going to make it uh, expensive. And then um, that, uh, the, you also need a backup system. Now, of course, nighttime, uh, winter, um, all of those require um, backup systems, and so that's another drawback for solar. Um, nuclear power um, if, is works because we break apart these big atoms um, to get the energy out. Um, it is old infrastructure because the, as that atom is broken apart, it releases heat, uh, which is then used to heat water and turn a turbine. So that's old infrastructure. It's really super efficient. You can get lots of energy from very little material. Um, but it is not renewable because there is a specific mineral set that we can use that energy from. Um, it is on demand though. Because it's so efficient, you can crank up that, um, that reaction when we need more energy. Um, and because it's not made from a carbon-based fuel, there's no carbon dioxide. Um, but because it is radioactive, there are some safety issues when we're talking about disposal of waste and then like when we have like our um, issue with Japan with their um, confluence of natural disasters that happened. Um, so one of the things to think about is what does on-demand mean? This is a video clip from uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Um, if you uh, go on Blackboard, uh, in essence what we're looking for is, um, so uh, Clark Griswold is trying to light his house up for the holidays, um, and when he goes to light his house up for the holidays, um, what we see is in the neighborhood, um, as he heats his neighborhood, or as he lights up his 
his house, the whole neighborhood kind of goes down. Um, that would be considered a brownout or a rolling blackout. And so what they have to do is um, they have to add the auxiliary nuclear in order to make that neighborhood come back online. And so um, as they make the neighborhood come back online, then um, uh, that's because they've cranked up that nuclear power. So that's what that means to be on demand. So if more people need power, um, more people get power. So nuclear is nice and reliable that way. Um, wind power is what we've been working with. A windmill is just a little bit different than a wind turbine. A windmill does work. A wind turbine generates electricity. So you've been working with wind turbines um, because it turns a turbine. That's old infrastructure. Of course, it's renewable, clean, and efficient because we're just dealing with wind. And wind has a really high um, probability of being able to provide a lot of the world's electricity. Um, just 80% of U.S. electricity in North Dakota and South Dakota alone. The reason why that can't happen, though, is because our grid system is old. The way we move electricity from place to place is very vulnerable and weak. And so that's going to be the job of your generation to help us make it smarter and less vulnerable. Um, we know that the Earth is heated unevenly, so that means there's always going to be wind. Um, but that's not necessarily reliable from in every, on every place and every day. And so that's another backup system is needed. And then there's um, the cost of the land. People like to develop land. So if you're using it for energy, you can't put a nice shopping mall or another business district in there. Um, and then one of the drawbacks that's often mentioned is noise. Um, but I would argue that noise is not an issue. Um, if you look at this PowerPoint online, this is actually a video that you can play. Um, please be aware that I was using this on an old iPhone 5, and you can hear the wind going across the microphone. So it's really hard to pick up the the noise of the turbine itself. So the data, what it actually says, when placed in the right distance from a house, turbines produce a sound of about 43 decibels. In comparison, your home air conditioner is about 50 decibels and your home refrigerator is about 40 decibels. So it shouldn't be any louder than appliances you have in your home. Um, and when we talk about size, um, we're, we're trying to maximize the length that the wind can push on this blade. And you look here, this is a full-size semi-truck, and you can see it ends right here. It took this guy about three tries to get around that corner to get on the interstate. Um, and I took that picture just off of I-80 East, bound in Iowa. And so... Um, so wind, we can't really um, get them any bigger, so we can't, we're, right now we're worried about efficiency for each turbine, but also how many turbines we have up. So that land use, the technology, and the size are kind of the drawbacks of those wind turbines. Hydroelectric is another type of old uh, infrastructure power. Um, this one works by falling water. Um, be careful of this word hydro. We're going to talk about another hydro power here in a minute. This is hydroelectric. So you build up this big lake behind a dam. The water flows through the dam and out in the, in the bottom somewhere is the turbine that gets turned to generate the electricity. So it is renewable. It's clean and efficient. Some of the drawbacks is those hydroelectric dams have limited lifetimes. This particular picture is of the Hoover Dam and it's nearing the end of its lifetime and now what do we do? Because it provides electricity for several states um, including the Las Vegas, Nevada area. Um, and then if you look, it makes this big lake. So what about the land rights of the people that live upstream? And what about the water rights of the people who live downstream? This is on the Colorado River, which used to empty to the Gulf of Mexico, that no longer makes it because of the Hoover Dam. This is all sandstone, and so that water all leaches out into the groundwater uh, area around it, and that water no longer makes it to the Gulf of Mexico. So um, there's some water rights issues and some ethical issues that go along with, um, with hydroelectric power. And then there's limited locations. Most of U.S. locations are already developed and cannot be um, any, any more made um, to uh, meet growing energy demands. So we're going to have to develop some new technology like from tides or wave energy without impacting those local ecosystems. Um, another kind is geothermal. Um, there's two kinds. Um, there's the heat pump kind and the steam kind. So you can think like small scale, large scale. Steam is large scale. Um, it is um, a big power generator in Iceland and Greenland, um, but what happens is hot water or steam from geysers are placed into like a fracture in the crust where there's a hot spot, and that is then used to generate steam to turn a turbine to generate electricity, so that's old infrastructure. Um, but you're limited by uh, the locations of those hot spots and where those are at, and sometimes by the amount of water in that area. You can pipe in the water, um, so it's mostly the hot spots. Um, and then, but then there's also some mineral issues when you pipe that water in. There's a lot of minerals that get added, makes the water a lot harder, and changes the ecology of that as well. Um, the other kind, the small-scale heat pump, 
Um, how that works is the ground below the frost level stays at about 50 degrees. Westside has one of these systems, which makes your um, regular furnace or heating and air conditioning systems more efficient because of that, that 50 degrees is 20 degrees warmer than winter air, and it's about 30 to 40 degrees cooler than summer air. If you pass the air over those pipes that have been um, heated or cooled to 50 degrees, then you can really increase the efficiency of your current heating or cooling system. And um, so because this uh, works, this is a new infrastructure, you'd have to put the pipes in. Um, it is expensive that way. Um, and then it's also the land use, like where do you put this? West Side was able to put one of these systems in when we redid our baseball fields in our sports complex. And so we have a vertical system. This one's horizontal, so you can see those pipes running back and forth. Our system actually runs up and down into the ground below the baseball field. Um, and so the cost of installation is really high. Um, and so most families can't afford to do something like that, nor do they have the land space available. The next one we'll talk about are biofuels. Uh, biofuels, this is a big one for Nebraska economy. Um, this is a net zero carbon fuel. Um, and this, so all the ones before have been really focused on the electrical industry and generating electricity. This one is one that directly relates to the auto and transportation industry. And so essentially what you're doing with biofuels is you're taking the crunchy stuff or the cellulose of plant matter and you're turning it into a biodiesel or an ethanol type plant. Um, and you can also make it from cooking oils. Um, this one is really super um, efficient in terms of how much energy you get out from the amount of material. If you compare it um, with about the same amount of material for oil, um, what we find is that biofuels only have about 22 units that go to waste, whereas oil has about 91 units that go to waste. Um, but the problem is we have a big public perception problem because um, we like to calculate in miles per gallon instead of cost per mile, and biofuels um, almost always win out on cost per mile. Um, especially when you're talking about biodiesel made from cooking oils, this is why restaurants get broken into sometimes if people are stealing their cooking oil. Um, some more benefits of biofuels, um, when you use uh, perennial grasses, it lowers the use of pesticides, it lowers erosion, it helps increase habitats. Um, even if it's, a, if it's one that's harvested every year like we do here in Nebraska for corn, it again still enha enhances that habitat and diversity. You can recycle the material, so after you um, make your biofuel, you can throw that um, used waste material back onto the fields to use as fertilizer. Um, and then the plants use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, so it's taking that carbon dioxide out of the air, and then when you burn that biofuel, you're putting that same carbon dioxide back into the air, so it's really a net zero carbon dioxide. The problem with biofuels, though, is that land usage problem again. People don't like to use land for energy because then they can't put their beautiful shopping malls up on it, and it's got that economic piece that goes with it. Um, and so biofuels, um, and they do use the old infrastructure because it works with the regular oil. The problem is we need to upgrade that infrastructure because it's a little more corrosive, um, and so uh, so that that infrastructure does need an upgrade to continue to use biofuels. And again, this is going for the auto industry. Another one working directly with the auto industry is hydrogen power. There's that, that prefix hydro again. So be careful you don't get hydrogen mixed up with hydroelectric. Those are two different ones. Um, hydrogen is an energy carrier. Um, so if you remember back to biology when you had ADP and NADPH and NADP, that H was really talking about hydrogen, so it's the same kind of concept. It works like a rechargeable battery. When you move that hydrogen ion around, um, you're moving electricity. Um, the problem is, is um, when made correctly, um, hydrogen has zero emissions. The only byproduct is water. But right now, we make hydrogen using very carbon-heavy methods. And so right now, use of hydrogen has actually got a heavier carbon footprint than just burning a gallon of gasoline. Um, automakers are ready now. The Toyota Mirari came out with a hydrogen vehicle in 2015, but the automotive industry is really moving towards electric as a more effective solution um, because that hydrogen um, has got too many infrastructure changes that needs to be made. Those uh, batteries don't last very long. They're heavy, um, and the lifetime of those fuel cells is short. Um, and so that hydrogen's just got a lot of infrastructure problems so that it's not really a feasible solution. Um, you'll see this little marking right here, demonstrations. There's another video below this one um, that you can see that hydrogen demonstration again uh, done in the lab. It's not how it works in a car. It was just for fun because, you know, science teachers, we like to blow stuff up. Um, so again, drawbacks are the technology, the infrastructure. 
Um, there are some safety issues with hydrogen gas kind of on its own. Um, if you've ever heard about the Hindenburg, um, that's one of those. And then again, that true zero carbon dioxide um, uh, production is needed. Um, so hydrogen challenges in the automotive industry are, are, quite, um, are quite extreme. Um, so those are the uh, alternative fuels you'll be tested over. Um, be able to compare and contrast those to know, uh, to know the benefits, drawbacks, as well as the uh, infrastructure issues with each of those um, and how they're produced, because um, in your test questions you'll be asked to compare and contrast. All right, Warriors, thanks for listening.